This is Exit 31 with Rain and Spencer on ESPN Radio and QSportsTalk.com. Wake me up when September ends. Your show is amazing. You don't get the show. Exit 31 starts now. I like turtles because they've been helping the Yankees win and get into that wild card. I like Syracuse Orange, want them to beat FSU. It's Football Friday, and I'm tr- I'm trying to think, you know, what else what else do I like? I mean, do I like you, Spencer? I was going to say, I hope so. I think I like you, Spencer. I also <laughs> like the Green Day jokes about, you know, wake up uh, Billy Joe Armstrong there before September ends. I hope somebody got him up yesterday. Because I didn't hear that joke or see that joke enough on social media yesterday, and with all these years on K-Rock, of course, play that song. It's still a thing. It's never going to go away now because he wrote that song. You think he's cool with that joke now? I, I think it probably is a little bit old for him. A little, but I, but you know what? I, I mean, it depends. Does he get royalties every time somebody like utters a "wake me up when September ends" jokes? It's like Justin Timberlake with "It's gonna be May." Yeah, it's gonna. You know what? You know what's funny about that too? Nothing. Uh, <laughs> at, at this point, nothing left. It's not funny anymore. It's just not. I've listened. I've listened to that song. Uh, and that's your fault uh, like, or your problem. Like not, I wouldn't say like really recently, maybe like last year or something. And he doesn't actually say my, this is me, right? He says me. Like I, I always thought because of that, I always thought like, it's gonna be my, you know, I tried to be but like, no. that's a you problem that you've yeah. listened to that song. And then I just blatantly well, I, admitted that I, I've, I've listened to that song because I knew the lyric. I'm, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm a very, um, uh, uh, curious person. And so when when something like that happens, I, I wonder, like, okay, does he really say that? So then I had to investigate. So I listened to the song, and he says, it's going to be me. So well, there you go. Everything you want to know about. Is it, were they in sync? Was that in sync? In sync, Not yeah. the Backstreet Boys? No. Justin Timberlake, J. Tim. Noster Davidson, Ray Stradamus. Let's go at it. Yeah. Who right? calls him J. Tim? Me. Okay. <laughs> Was that? I thought it was J. T. <laughs> Is that as bad as the Green Day joke? <laughs> Spencer Davidson's got his Yankee hat back on. My name is Rain. Glue guy is here. My dogs are in the house. Glue guy, solid job. Uh, changing things up for a, a little bit of a fresh October 1st open there. Even though Brent Dax is going to call it cheesy radio. Yeah, that's all right. That's all right. He, he, was, he wasn't loving the September thing on the 21st with Earth, Wind, and Fire either. But he likes to be a contrarian. But... Something we're going to get to in a second is something he got to with Tommy DeVito yesterday. Orange Nation aired it. It's the conversation heard around Central New York. We wanted to hear what Tommy DeVito thought about not being named the starter for the Liberty game. And Dino Babers giving that responsibility to Garrett Schrader. It's, of course, his job tomorrow against Florida State, against FSU and the Seminoles down in Florida. So we'll get to that in just a second. Um, still shocked by it. I'm not the only one. I think that is the consensus. We were all shocked that Garrett Schrader was named the starter. I'm on record having said that I thought it was the right move, not just for this year to develop him in this system, but to give him give them the dual threat and looking at the next couple of seasons. Because, listen, you win one game, you're rebuilding. That's a fact. And yeah. you know what? Y- your litmus test is to beat an a winless ACC opponent in your first conference matchup of the year. Think about that. That's the reality, okay? This is the best team that you're going to play, and they haven't won a game yet. If you can't beat them, as crazy as this college football has se- season has been for the Power Five conferences, let alone the ACC, that's where we are, Spencer. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the record, you, you got to look at the record as, you know, the record is who you are. And so, you know, as much as we we like to say that, you know, Florida State is still Florida State, I mean, the reality is they're an 0-4 team. And you can't let an 0-4 team notch their first win against you if you hope to remain streaking and you hope to really prove something in the ACC. The ACC is wide open this year. Mm -hmm. But if you're Syracuse, you have to take it. You have to earn it. I'm not saying necessarily saying they're going to be ACC champions, but I'm saying if you are going to have solid positioning in the ACC, if you're Syracuse, you can't just rely on other teams to lose. You need to take control and win. Florida State's own four. They got a running back, uh, just Sean Corbin, who's first in ACC with an average of nine point one five yards per carry. I I think that's good, right? Yeah, third in the I'd conference. Say. He's got four hundred and thirty nine yards, which is a great total until you realize 
Sean Tucker has 100 more, and he's second in the nation, and now they're chirping Heisman. So listen, these teams want to run the ball. I think we know that. They've got an edge rusher named Jermaine Johnson. He is among the national leaders in sacks. He has five and a half. We have a couple of players that are in, in that conversation as well. But yeah. Marlo Wax and Cody Roscoe. I think we see what some of these keys to the game are. But then we need our quarterback, Garrett Schrader, to throw the ball around a little bit to keep him honest. Listen, Sean Tucker's got a challenge in front of him, okay? He's clearly the featured back. Florida State has a stable of running backs. But they're stingy as far as stopping the run, especially in the second half of a game when they lock running backs under three yards per carry. So, And then there's the question marks of the offensive line, Spencer. Jeez, let me leave you that to explain. Yeah, I mean, it's like a Jekyll and Hyde. It's like, which one's going to show up today? And they're going to need the offensive line to be solid because the thing is, is FSU is going to be defending the run. I mean, Garrett Schrader has not completed a pass yet over 20 yards. They're going to be stacking the box. They're going to be defending against the run. So the offensive line really needs to create some holes for Sean Tucker. And honestly, they need to be able to pass protect as well because Garrett Schrader isn't going to complete passes if he's on the run. He, You know, Tommy DeVito, that is Tommy DeVito's strength. DeVito can pass while on the run. Garrett Schrader is not as strong as that. So really, the offensive line is going to be really, really important here. But that being said, as good as some of the players on this Seminoles defense is, are, are, right? Plural. We'll go with R. Yeah, we'll go with R. Uh, as good as they are, uh, they are not that good at limiting big plays. True. Sean Tucker himself has a bunch of, he was ripped off a bunch of large runs this year. And chunk runs, Chunk right? runs. Chunk yards. Chunk runs. Um, and and FSU has, has allowed 18 plays of 20 or more yards, including plays of 41, 49, 259 yard runs that they've given up. So despite the fact that they're going to be heavily defending against the run, Sean Tucker has an opportunity here against a team that is not very good at stopping big plays. Don't forget his ability to catch the ball out of the backfield. All-purpose yards, 7-11. Is he the leading receiver on the team, too? Yes, I I think that he is. is. And don't forget, on the flip side of that, Syracuse and this defense that we seem to be believing in based on what we've seen through four games is 18 sacks overall. I mean, we just highlighted a couple of guys, but... You know, they're getting it done. They're getting into the backfield. You're going to have to continue that, right? Some of the keys to the game. Uh, but at any point in time, as we continue here on Exit 31, it's ESPN Radio, QSportsTalk.com, where we'll find you in the chat momentarily. But Axe talked to Tommy DeVito yesterday. That happens on Thursdays, and he was as shocked as the rest of us. Let's actually get to that audio that everybody's been discussing. It was a day like I've not experienced before. You know, normal day. Walkthroughs, meetings, everything. Right before we got on the bus, you know, coach called me and said, uh, let's come down to one of the meeting rooms. And then, you know, he told me Garrett was starting. You know, that was two hours before the game. I mean, all week, everything going into it, there was no indication otherwise. So, I mean, it was a shock to me as well. But, I mean, got to make sure that the team stays in it, keep a level head, and, you know, and then have a discussion afterwards because there was no discussion that was had there. It was something that was had Sunday because the game was on Friday. So, you know, that's just what it was. And then, you know, wait. And if I was going to go in the game, I remember was going to when my number was called, you know, just be ready for that opportunity. Yeah, because I I don't believe for two seconds that you're not going to see Tommy DeVito again at some point this year. If, I guess, if the game dictates it and there's a necessity to have to throw the ball, that's the guy to do it. Does he come in? Is he the closer? There's always that possibility. He's not happy about it. And, And I believe that he thought he had done everything necessary to be the starter, then basically last minute he finds out he's not. Trust me, Tommy DeVito wants to play, wants to start, and has a chip on his shoulder now. He's not happy about this, but he'll be ready. He will be ready. Yeah, I mean, he's he's he, I, I, you can't blame him for not being happy about it. Not. I mean, the guy wants to play, and you, you like to see that attitude because, you know, you, you, you want somebody who wants to compete. That being said, you know, <laughs> the thing is, though, if we're realistically talking about it, if you don't see Tommy DeVito again, that means good things for Syracuse. And yeah. what I mean by that is You're right. that means Garrett Schrader is really performing and they don't need to bring DeVito in to help the passing game. Uh, I th- I do agree with you in the sense that I do think we will see him again at some point. But but again, you got to look at it as if we don't, I, that, that's not a bad thing. It's no offense, Tommy, but I don't want to see you. 
Yeah. If Garrett's starting, I don't want to see you. Yeah. He stays in that whole game. That means enough is happening offensively where we've got a football game happening and a chance to win it. That's all you want at the end, and, and then you get it done, right? Yeah. Score one more point than the other team, and you're good to go. But how does Tommy DeVito stay ready under these circumstances where he is not the starter heading into tomorrow's game? He told Brent yesterday. He got the majority of the reps, um, being that he's going to start the game off. It's nothing new to me. Now it's something that I've done ever since I was you know, younger. You know, you always just have to, if you're not getting the physical reps, you have to have all the mental reps as possible. So whether that's watching more film and being locked in anytime he's in or any other quarterback's in, just being locked into the play and, you know, saying, what would you do in this situation? Like knowing what you're going to do before the ball is even snapped and then reacting to the defense. So for me, you know, that was kind of back to 2018 with Eric. You know, you, you got to be ready whenever your name's called. So, you know, just bringing that mindset back into it and always having that in the chamber for when I'm ready to go. There is a maturity and a leadership quality there that, that says to me, that is the mindset. Listen, not every Every backup or starter that then gets demoted is going to have, especially at this age, where they're going to be mature enough to handle that, but yet just be ready to go. Some do, some don't. Sometimes you have some problems in the locker room, but he's proven before, he just said it right there, that he can do this. Mm -hmm. He can handle this responsibility. He has played this role for this team before. So Tommy's going to be ready if that's necessary. It's Exit 31 ESPN Radio and QSportsTalk.com. A little taste of sound check with Tommy DeVito. We have more of that about 3.30 with Dino from the Dino Baber Show last night. We'll talk to Jason Paulus from WKTV. Spencer's colleague. That's right. Co-worker. About time. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> we'll get into that in a few minutes. The breakdown with Stephen Bailey from 24-7 Sports is on the way today. Uh, Matt Marshall with the Orlando Sentinel and Tribune covers Florida State. He'll be behind enemy lines at 3.00. And uh, since this is the home of Giants football, I'm talking ESPN Radio, John Schmelk on a football Friday with our weekly breakdown of the New York football Giants who are trying to avoid basically being Florida State and 0-4. Oh, that is that is tough. So is your team, though, so I guess it's not as bad for me. All hail the Buffalo Bills fans in central New York. So Gross. that being said, let's transition off of that for a second. We're going to revisit this Syracuse football discussion repeatedly throughout the next couple of hours. Uh, mini kerfuffle time. Have you seen the Oreos trolling the Boston Red Sox, who, by the way, they won two of three and beat in the series, which only further helped the New York Yankees, for example, get to the wild card. Uh, talking about wanting to wreck some seasons. Did you giggle a little bit to yourself? I did. I did. And, and then they said, you know, the the chaos. What was it like? A, was it Agents of Chaos that they wrote? Or I know it was I am chaos. I am chaos. Yeah, this, I love that. This was the quote in the post game right after uh, last night's game. We want to ruin some seasons. We want to ruin some seasons. We want to ruin some seasons. They also, at Oreos, by the way, if you want to find them, like, for example, on Twitter and their social media, especially if you're a Yankees fan or you hate the Red Sox as much as we do. They were talking about, and they brought up the curse of Robert Andino in 2011. I don't know if you saw that. That's when they won the division with like two outs in the ninth inning. They two runs. I think it was Manny Machado was involved in the play back when he was there. Mm -hmm. It was awesome, and it just broke the hearts of the Red Sox fans, and it was hilarious. And didn't the Orioles of all teams dig that out and throw that back out into the the public sphere yesterday to further troll them? It's troll level Jedi. Yeah. I, I, it's it's like you know you remember the the year that uh, the the Yankees were playing the Rays to close out the season at mm -hmm. Tropicana Field. Yeah, and if the Rays won, the Rays would solidify the wild card and knock the Red Sox out of the playoffs. We had to root and we had to root for Boston, <laughs> and then Evan Longoria, I believe, hit the home run down the line. Right? Yeah, he, Evan Longoria hit the run, hit the home run down the line to beat the Yankees, and that was I think the first time that I was happy. That the Yankees lost because it meant because the Yankees were already in the Yankees already clinched so it was the first time that I rooted against the Yankees because of the fact that that meant the Red Sox were out first and only time I've ever only done that time. in my life only and time. it was weird he pulled it right down the line if you remember the fence is lower in that area mm -hmm. of the drop just in that little corner and it just cleared it yeah like if he hit that to the would have been the right if you're facing the wall, maybe 10 feet. Oh, it yeah. would have hit the wall and not been out. It was yep. it was crazy, the circumstances. It just played out perfectly. And continue. Also, also uh, Cedric Mullins was named the uh, the most valuable Oriole for this year. Really cool connection to Central New York. Cedric Mullins in 2014 played in the Summer Collegiate Baseball League for the Utica, then, then the Utica Brewers. Now they're known as the Utica Blue Sox. PGCBL. PGCBL. Yeah, perfect that, game, Collegiate Baseball League. So Cedric Mullins... 
actually spent a summer here in Utica, and now he is an all-star and the most valuable Oriole. Yeah, he's remarkable offensively and defensively. What a find for them. Uh, Brady and the Pats, or is it um, another former Patriot that might be the guy to focus on there, Spencer, for Sunday night football? What do you think about that? Is there a kerfuffle in there at all? Well, everybody's talking about the fact that Tom Brady is going up against his former team in the New England Patriots. That's literally how they're That's selling the hype. That's literally how they're selling it, which I understand. It's a, it, like, I understand the hype. I'm not knocking the hype. But lost in all this, which I thought about today, was the fact that Rob Gronkowski is also Sup, Gronk. going up against the Patriots for the first time. So, like, it, it just the fact that everyone's saying Brady versus Belichick, Brady versus Bel- Like, what about Gronk? I mean, what about Gronk going up against his former team? Because Gronk is an all-time Patriots great as well. He's an all-time tight end, too. Yeah. He, he just, really yeah. is. But, like, he, I mean, he's playing the Pats for the first time. Blue so guy why just is nobody, smiled. Why is nobody talking about his return? Blue guy just smiled when we praised uh, his tight end, too. Former tight end, too. Hey, you also got Antonio Brown, too, coming back against yeah, his but, former team. But uh, but that's not. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the guy to build yeah. this. I was going to say, Antonio, Antonio, Brown, Brown. Antonio Brown had like half a cup of coffee there. A.B. versus Belichick. Yeah, hype the game that way for Sunday Night Football. I absolutely love it. You know what? Totally overlook that. Totally overlook that. Yeah. Solid, solid glue guy. Uh, Barstool Cuse is going at it with Barstool FSU, by the way. 30 seconds. Explain that to him, Spencer. Yeah, so Barstool FSU actually tweeted out uh, a couple hours ago, imagine your mascot being an orange. Hashtag beat Syracuse. Well, then Barstool Cuse uh, shot back and said, imagine being 0-4 and, and being a, quote, football school. Syracuse, that's a basketball school. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Doc? <laughs> F-U-F-S-U. <laughs> we'll leave it there. ESPN Radio, Exit 31. We'll be back in the chat at QSportsTalk.com. We're talking to Jason Paulus next. Hang tight. Football Friday. Football. This is Exit 31 with Rain and Spencer on ESPN Radio and QSportsTalk.com. We have a very special treat here. My good friend and colleague, Jason Paulus from WKTV News Channel 2, joining us on the phone lines here on Exit 31, ESPN Radio, QSportsTalk.com. Dot com. Very excited to finally get Jason on. And uh, Jason, first of all, welcome to the airwaves here. I want to I want to ask you something, though. Um, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but uh, prior to getting a job at WKTV, Jason was the sports director and I was actually Jason's intern. So my question for you is, was Spencer Davidson the best sports intern you ever had? Oh, without a doubt. <laughs> no question. Does Spencer always Absolutely talk about no him? Question. Does he always talk about himself in third person? Whoa! Um, only now. Yeah, and deservedly so. Yeah. Well, now now that I got the uh, the second gig, I think I can afford the the third person. What's what would second person be? I mean, I can't. I don't know what second person is. Just stay in first person, uh, and I right. think we're good. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, Jason, again, thank you, and, and welcome to the. To wait, the, wait, wait. What? what? What took so long? What for you to invite him on? Well, he's 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 a hot commodity. I, I had to go, you know, I had to go through his agent. And I had, you know, then then he had to give dates and his times when he's available. people had to talk to my people. Exactly. Was, we cut through the red tape. Yeah, we had to cut through the red tape, and that's why it finally happened. Let's talk some sports. Go. <laughs> Perfect stuff. Well, Jason, uh, you and I have have been watching plenty of Yankees games together uh, up in the newsroom there, and and yesterday's game, of course, the the Yankees rallied uh, and hit just a bunch of bombs. So. We we saw the Yankees go, go on a tear, and then we saw the Yankees once again look like the anemic offense team, the offensive team that we saw early in the year. With this run now, here in the last week of the regular season and heading in potentially to the playoffs, do you finally feel confident about this team moving forward? That this is that can be the team that we thought it it should be at the beginning of the year. Well, I think what they're able to do now is they're finally playing as a team. Like uh, uh, the sign of a good team is, you know, when your pitching's having a rough day, your offense picks up the game. When your offense is struggling a little bit, you get a gem out of your starting pitcher. Um, they're, they're, they have, I say, top five bullpen mm. in the league right now. Um, you know, and that's <laughs> this is the bull, This is not the bullpen that they expected to start the season, but it's the bullpen that's going to get them deep into the playoffs as long as their offense continues to produce. I really believe, though, that they're playing right now as a complete team. They have confidence. Um, and like I said, you know, you've got a starting pitcher that's starting to struggle a little bit. It seems like whether it's Stanton, Judge, 
you know, some timely hits from Gardy. Um, all those guys are really stepping up, and you're going to see as long as they continue to play like that. And I think this, you know, everyone's making a big deal out of this game, this, this three-game series with the Rays. Even if they go 0-3, they still, I think, have a really good chance of making the playoffs, um, mm -hmm. let alone w winning the first spot. And there's a great article, um, if you check out MLB.com, that breaks down all of the tiebreaker situations and what would happen regarding a – you know, uh, a wild card scenario where so many people are tied. Uh, it's a really good breakdown. You guys should check it out if you haven't already, because that, that to me is the key of understanding. All right. So the Yankees get two games. Uh, that's their magic number to totally clinch, but that's their magic number. I believe to clinch the top, top spot yep. in the playoffs. So they could get away with a one in two series against the Rays and still make the playoffs, but you want that home game. So I, I think they are poised um, this weekend, they're at home. They got the Rays. They can win these games. And if they take two out of three, they're confident. They, win, they get that home game for a playoff. And then, you know, we go from there. I mean, historically, those one-game playoffs are not always, you know, on the side of the Yankees. I think this year it could be. Yeah. This is Jason Paulus, uh, co-worker of Spencer Davidson with WKTV, talking New York Yankees, ESPN Radio, and QSportsTalk.com. Kind of a two-parter for you, Jason. I want to stay with the Yankees. With Cole's struggles, he's had a couple of stinkers for starts of re uh, recently, the five runs and then the previous start where he gave up the seven runs. Uh, that I want you to analyze because are you worried about him heading into the playoffs, assuming they make it? Mm -hmm. And number two, has everybody just climbed on Giancarlo Stanton and Aaron Judge is back because the judge, man, he just rose again last night with a couple more bombs. Uh, yes, to, to, your, to your second question, yes. They're riding that wave. But that will, that will not only push them on into the playoffs, but you know it. When guys are hot, the rest of the team rallies around that. And you're going to start to see other guys start to hit well, too, because it's a confidence issue. I mean, let's face it. Hitting is as much knowledge as it is confidence in yourself to do the job. Yeah. And when other guys are successful around you, it's very rare that when you see you know three, four guys on a team playing well, that everybody else tanks it. No, this is the playoffs. They're ready to go. I really think that you're, you're going to see enough hitting and timely hitting throughout these next few games and into the playoffs. Now, as for, for Cole, I'll tell you, um, I'm a little nervous only because he struggled when you don't want him to struggle. But he's a big game pitcher, okay? You put him in a spotlight, He's going to be fine, especially if you need him to win that big one in Yankee Stadium. He was yeah. a monster in the wild card last year. We gave some stats out on that last night on Yankees on deck. Trust, uh, you want that same performance. And if you get that same performance in the wild card, the Yankees are fine as far as Garrett Cole being on the mound. Spencer, sorry. Yeah, no, absolutely. And actually, to Jason's point quickly, uh, you know, I, you're seeing guys now like Glaber Torres start to heat up a little bit. So guys who had been really struggling are now starting to seem like they're breaking out of it, and that's going to be huge for the Yankees. But I want to uh, shift the focus over to, to Syracuse football. And we had a treat last week, Jason, where since they played a Friday night game, we actually got to check out some of the game together. Um, so mm -hmm. I just, based off of what you saw last week, their first really true test of the season, the way that they were able to, to overcome that and win, you know, at the end of the game. Like, how are you feeling about this team as they head down to the Sunshine State to take on an 0-4 FSU team? Uh, I'm sorry. FSU's not good. <laughs> They're not good right now, okay? And Syracuse is playing well. They're not playing great, but they're playing well. And when you play well and you play good defense, their defense really – bailed them out in the end of that game last week. Yeah, last week. Yep. And that was big. They had takeaways that they needed. Um, they, they were playing tough football on the de defensive side of the ball. And that is what they're going to need because it's not easy to go down to Florida State and get a win. Just because they're 0-4, it's still, it's still Florida State. Right. Um, I was shocked that the way the whole Garrett Schrader thing went down. I think everybody was yeah. to a person. Name me one person that said, oh, yeah, I expected that to happen. No way. <laughs> Nobody thought two hours before game time, Garrett Schrader. And I'm driving home after the game because we were all pumped up. That was a heck of a finish. Yep. I'm driving home, and I hear on the radio, oh, yeah, he decided uh, two hours before the game to start Garrett. What? That's unheard of. Um, 
you know, kudos to coach for making that call. Um, I've never met Dino Babers in person, so I don't know. I know he's a stand-up individual. And if he made that call just two hours, that means he had something that he has been, that has been brewing for a while, and it finally clicked. Whether he saw it during practice during the week or whatever it was, um, and he had that conversation, and it needed to take place. He, Trader wasn't phenomenal. He wasn't, oh, my God, that was the best move ever, but they got the W. The guy that's they're going to need a huge another huge game from, and you know he'll bring it, is Sean Tucker. Yeah, yeah, that's the key. He is absolutely the key uh, for Syracuse. Jason, uh, listen. No, over 100 yards. Every time he's over 100 yards, they win the game. That's another thing to remember. Yep. We're up against the break. Jason Paulus with WKTV is on with us. Oh, we've got to make this a regular thing, Spencer. Absolutely. So set this up maybe on a weekly basis. I, I'm going to leave you with a, a really quick, easy choice as a final question. Well, no, okay. actually, it's not an easy choice. I'm lying to you. Who's going to win first, the Giants or the Jets? This weekend, could either one of them get their first win? <laughs> um, not going to see the Giants beat the Saints. That's not going to happen. Um, Jets, Tennessee. The Jets playing? They're playing the Titans um, this weekend. Nope. Which, yeah. Nope. nope. Uh, <laughs> nah, no, I think we're all, both 0-4. <sighs> yes. I, what I, I was I afraid you were going to say. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and I don't think anybody to a person is going to disagree with me. No, no, <laughs> no, I'm certainly not. And I'm a Giants fan and Spencer's a Jets fan, as you know. Well, that's Jason Paulus. We're really grateful to you for the time. Enjoy the rest of your Friday and all of the fun sports that's going to be coming at you. And I look forward to talking to you again. And we'll get Spencer back in third person next time. CSPN Radio Exit 31. <laughs> We're at QSportsTalk.com. Right back with our breakdown with Stephen Bailey from 24-7 Sports. Let's revisit the Syracuse FSU conversation. This is Exit 31 with Rain and Spencer on ESPN Radio and QSportsTalk.com. Visually, you can see Exit 31 at QSportsTalk.com. Bring it onto the radio on ESPN Radio. And on the Accelerate Sports Complex phone line, our Friday preview, our breakdown with Stephen Bailey from 24-7 Sports. Uh, he had his lunch, so he's good to go. And, and I want to get started on this SU-FSU matchup, and I want to talk about these quarterbacks. Nope, not ours, believe it or not. Let's talk about Mackenzie Milton, Jordan Travis. You take it from there. Uh, what's Who are we looking at stopping as far as FSU's offense? I know the running backs are the thing, but let's start there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think... So, so I think... Stopping the run is the key, and the difference is when, when Millen is in the game, you don't really have to account for him in the run game. But if, if Travis is healthy and plays, uh, you do, potentially. And I, I don't think, you know, uh, it's not like a Malik Willis situation, right? It's not like he's the primary guy, but, you know, you you got to cover him up or he'll keep the RPOs. And maybe you know, the way Tommy DeVito found success against Ohio uh, a similar a similar style to that, someone you got to account for, or, or he'll take the yardage. So, um, you know, I, I think the focus is clearly on the run game. It does definitely center around Florida State's two running backs. That's that's really what what they've done well offensively is they've had explosive runs. It hasn't been consistent, but you know when they have broken free, it's, it's been big gains. So, you know, safety play is going to be important in run support. There, a guy like we saw Justin Barron. Uh, do really well in his first start at Rover against Liberty. I, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw him there again. Uh, kind of, probably a little bit better in run support than he is in coverage. Um, if Jahad Carter is out, we may, maybe we'll see Eric Coley again, but whoever that boundary safety is will play a key role there. And, of, of course, the front six. But, and the linebackers have been so good this year. But, uh, you know, that's what Florida State's done. When they found success, it's been the running backs getting to the second and third level and, and, and really breaking free. Steven, uh, you mentioned a little bit about the running backs for, for FSU. Uh, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and with, with uh, Deshaun Corbin, I mean, leading the, the ACC in, in yards per carry, and Sean Tucker obviously leading the ACC in, in rushing yards and all-purpose yards because he's second in the nation, uh, do you see this coming down really to the running game? Do you see Syracuse implement the pass a little bit more. I mean, Schrader has not shown that he really has much in the passing game, but really, where do you think this game is decided? It's a good question. I mean, both teams are going to try and run the ball. Uh, if they're successful, they're going to keep running the ball. And if they're not successful, they're going to need to figure something out. Um, you know, frankly, I, I think the Syracuse defense is up to, is up to task. Me too. You know, it won't, it won't be perfect, but I do, you know, I those guys have – the movement skills, especially the linebackers, 
to hold their own there. I think the defensive line has been great. They got six six quality contributors who they're rotating. They're fresh. Um, you know, I, I think you know it won't be perfect. I'm not saying that, but I but I, I think they'll be able to to slow Florida State down and, and force them to try and throw the ball. So maybe we'll see more of McKenzie Milton on the other side. This is going to be a really good litmus test for Garrett Schrader and Sean Tucker and that outside zone RPO type, you know, type style that that SU has used uh, not only against Liberty but against Ohio. You know, stretching teams um, vertically, you know, using their their playmakers on the outside. The receivers have blocked well and, and letting Sean Tucker get to the edge, cut, and do what he does. And obviously, Garrett Schrader has shown that he can pull those looks. Maybe you have that same action, and, and he pulled it. And you know, can he win those one-on-one matchups against ACC defensive ends and outside linebackers? Safety. Uh, I don't know. You know, if I'm being honest, I, 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 you know, I think Florida State will probably be able to slow that down. Um, you know, they have a great defensive line. Jermaine Johnson leads the nation in sacks. They're only allowing about three yards per carry. I think Syracuse might have to throw the ball too. And, and you know, the question is, can Garrett Schrader get it done? or will they have to turn to Tommy DeVito? But let's put it this way. If either team can consistently run the ball against a heavy box, I don't think it's, it's you know, I think that team will win handily. So but I don't think either team will. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting you brought up, especially because FSU, as we were, you know, reading through some scouting reports a little bit earlier, we brought this up earlier today on Exit 31 here on ESPN Radio. In the second half specifically, FSU limits the run game to under three yards per carry. So I wonder, is that when you maybe make that halftime adjustment and try to get a little bit more of the run aspect of the RPO going? Uh, Obviously, Taj is the key receiver, but maybe try to spread the ball around a little bit and change the flow of the game. Maybe, you know, I I think, you know, I think Dino Babers and Sterling Gilbert have, extra wrinkles to show in the RPO game that they haven't, or, or maybe they've just flashed, right? We saw Sean Tucker in a, in a Jeff sweep action once against Liberty. You know, maybe you see him out on the way. Maybe you see him and Abdul Adams in the game together, or, right? You find the way to get Tyres the ball. We saw those pop, pop pass opportunities with, with Taj and Courtney Jackson. Um, so they certainly have wrinkles. I mean, t- frankly, I mean, I don't, I don't think – you know, I don't think they're going to fool Florida State with those looks. It's assignment football. Florida State knows what's coming. It's just going to be can Syracuse's playmakers win in space. Uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know. And, and obviously up front, can the offensive line do better than it did against Rutgers? I mean, you know, that, that that's not going to be good enough. And they have Dakota Davis back. Chris Elmore is going to be back at tight end and fullback, so that helps. But – you know, it, uh, it's it's going to be. I think it's going to be tough, and I think Dino Babers could could have a difficult decision to make. Uh, you know, at halftime, if, if the offense under Schrader isn't able to move the ball. Yeah, Stephen Bailey with twenty four seven Sports. Uh, I was that was going to be kind of my next question. Do you think that because of the fact that you know Schrader hasn't really been able to get anything going in the passing game? Do you think that there is a real possibility we see DeVito come in at some point to potentially add that element to their game here, or do you think that Schrader sees this the whole way through? I mean, if the offense isn't working with Schrader on the field, uh, yeah, I mean, Dino's you got to turn to DeVito, right? I, I, and I'm not saying, maybe, look, maybe Syracuse is able to run the ball, even if Florida State kind of knows what's coming, or maybe Garrett Schrader hits his shots. Maybe, you know, they get Damian Alford or Taj Harris free over the top and hit a big play and that loosens things up. Uh, but, yeah, if it's not working, I mean, I think I think Dino Babers has made it very clear that he's going to do whatever he thinks is in his team's best interest. And, I mean, that was shocking kind of everybody in starting Garrett Schrader last week. I mean, I don't think this is coming, but I think if Dino thought Tommy gave him the best chance to win this week, he would start him in spite of everything he said. Uh, so yeah, I mean, personally, I think this is a game plan that better suits Tommy DeVito than Garrett Schrader. Uh, but we, you know, we haven't seen exactly how good Schrader and and a a rushing attack can be. So it's, it's an extended look, but I think back to that Liberty game, the last five drives that Syracuse had, they didn't get more than 20 yards. Mm. I mean, you know, Liberty was playing against the run at that point. So again, can Syracuse run the ball against a team that knows the run is coming? 
We will see. It's going to be very interesting. As you was on with our very own Brent Axe on the block yesterday, we've all heard that audio by now. We shared that a, a little bit ago here on Exit 31 on ESPN Radio and QSportsTalk.com. What is your take on the Tommy DeVito being told you're not starting against Liberty timeline? Uh, I mean, you kind of can't help but feel for him, right? I mean, the guy gets told a couple hours before kickoff he's not starting. He started basically every game he was healthy for the last two-plus years and doesn't get a full explanation from Dino Babers until Sunday. And that's a long time. Like, you know, you don't – you can't pretend to have the full picture, but from Tommy's perspective, definitely really hard to swallow. And, and now, you know, I mean, this is the guy who played – through a rib injury two years ago, got beaten up <laughs> basically the last two years behind one of the worst offensive lines in the FBS. Season ending foot injury last year. You come back, you know, week one, you find out your fullback's out. Uh, you don't have Dakota Davis, your best interior lineman, until week three. And now you get benched <laughs> when the offensive line is healthy. <laughs> The fullback is back, <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're, they're maybe starting to call more concept-based passes uh, that, that, you know, you were stuck kind of with more of the choice routes. And, I mean, Garrett Schrader struggled with the choice routes, too, against Liberty. And you could tell he did not know which way his receivers were going to go at the top of their break. So you're seeing more like design play action. Uh, so, I mean, I just think I think that's tough. I think – this is this would be the the best situation that Devito would be placed in to succeed, you know, since the 2018 season, and, and he's kind of got to watch from the sidelines. But I, I I do think he will play again this year, um, like we said, possibly as soon as Saturday. Yeah, and the other thing too is uh, Cuse is 0 6 down when they play mm-hmm. Florida State and are on the road. Last but not least, before we close out with you, Stephen Bailey giving us a breakdown. He's, of course, with 24-7 Sports here on ESPN Radio. The injuries are the hour report. You mentioned Elmore is going to be back. Uh, Benson, we're hearing, is practicing. Maybe a wrinkle from Elmore. You can sneak in a tidbit on that if you want. But who else do we have to worry about being in or out of the lineup? You know, the only two names I'm really watching are Benson, who's still dealing with a knee injury from uh, the Albany game. I I genuinely don't know if he's going to play, and his absence would be significant. And then Jihad Carter, the starting boundary state, he hasn't played the last two games. I think Eric Coley has done well to fill in, uh, but Jihad's short short field burst, his movement skills, would be really nice to have on the field for Syracuse and ACC play. I mean, that's it's it's going to be needed in run support. So um, Syracuse is lucky to, to, for that to basically be it in week five, considering what the injury reports have been like in the past. So that's you know, that's about as, as good as you can hope for after four weeks. Stephen Bailey used the word unscathed with us a couple of weeks ago, and for the most part, that's where Syracuse stands as far as injuries. Monday, 2.30, Stephen Bailey will be back to break down the game tomorrow against FSU and, of course, the opponent, SU. Hey, why not Cuse? This is ESPN Radio Exit 31, QSportsTalk.com. Let's get into the chat. It's firing up, and uh, we'll thank Stephen for the time as always. You're killing me, Smalls. Is next. <laughs> You're killing me, Smalls. This is Exit 31. Here is Rain and WKTV Sports Director Spencer Davidson on ESPN Radio and QSportsTalk.com. You're killing me, Smalls. So you're going to figure out why this is killing me, Smalls, and I roll my eyes, my sports festivus or airing of the grievances, after I play it. I'm going to play you this piece of audio, and then I'm going to tell you who it is, and then I'm going to tell you why I'm playing it. Okay? Okay. Are you ready for this? Let's do it. Let's do it. That was the hardest but greatest year ever for me. I mean, thank you guys. I know I ain't been in there much after the game let y'all celebrate, but tonight, man, is a special, special night. I just want to thank God for you guys and, and thank God for everything that's happened. Okay, guys? I love you guys, man. God. And then they, uh... Okay, give you a chance to guess first. Who is that? Who do you think that was? Go uh, ahead. Can you, can, you, can you give a little hint in terms of sport? Uh, that's baseball. Baseball. Yep. And he has managed a bunch of teams. He's a manager. Dusty Baker. Dusty Baker. It was for what team is he currently managing? Do you do you remember the Houston Trastros? Yeah. So there's the thing. He's the first manager in Major League Baseball history to win a division title with five different teams. He'd been around, as you know, uh, the Nationals, right? Did he manage the Cubs? I believe the Giants was the another Giants one. Was another one. Uh, then there is obviously Houston and one other team that I'm forgetting. 
Needless to say, the point is, that's an amazing accomplishment. You've got to give him credit. You know, he's a decent baseball player, too. Yeah. Had a hell of a career. And then, of course, very successful as a manager. But then when you win that one, he came in, obviously it was after the cheating scandal and everything like that, but it just, the stench remains. Mm-hmm. And I don't like it. I don't like that they keep winning division titles. They, they've been in the mix every year since 2017. They're on a pretty good run. And don't get me wrong, they've got some good players, but they got to the promised land by cheating. Yeah. So it's tough for me. I, I, I want to celebrate Dusty Baker because he's obviously won four division titles with four other teams prior to coming to Houston, but it's hard to recognize that one. It just It still feels tainted with the Houston Astros. Is it just me? No, no. And and uh, really quick, uh, the other team that we couldn't think of, the Cincinnati Reds, that's, was the other team that he, that he right. managed. Yes. But it, 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 the th- it still bothers me that the Astros essentially got like a slap on the wrist yeah, no in terms punishment. of their players weren't suspended. It, it's just like, it, it just still bothers me. And, I th- and, you know, I think the players, the way that they handled it too, I mean, you know, the, 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 the apology, I mean, that totally wasn't sincere. I'm happy for the accomplishment on its own. It's great to see. Good for you, Dusty. Well, yeah, he you just w- can't stand the team that you did it with. Yeah, and, and he and he wasn't with them for that, so you can't you can't True. pin the blame on him. Um, but it is tough to be totally happy considering the fact that we all just want the Houston Astros to go away. Yeah, yeah, it, it's still out there. There's a lot of players in the league that still have an issue with that. Some of them are currently on the Yankees. Yeah, one of them may or may not have been there and. Had a bad start a couple days ago. Yikes. Lakers. Oh, sorry, Garrett. I hate to bring you into this, but I had to. Here it goes. You're killing me, Smalls. Quick break. Let's go behind enemy lines. We'll go BHL with Matt Merchel of Orlando Sentinel and Tribune to talk FSU Syracuse. And that is next on ESPN Radio Exit 31 and we're at QSportsTalk.com. This means war. Rain and WKTV sports director Spencer Davidson go behind enemy lines. This means war. Oh, poof, a war. How dare you call me crazy? This means war. <laughs> this means war. This means intense conflict. Nah, it's not the same. This is Exit 31 on ESPN Radio and QSportsTalk.com. Last time Q's won against FSU, the Seminoles was 30-7 to in 2018. We'll take that, but it doesn't bode well because it's not much of a competition on the road. And, yeah, it's a road game for Q's. Now we go B-E-L, as I mistyped uh, and said B-H-L, um, and then read the teleprompter like Ron Burgundy. Let's bring in uh, an enemy combatant. Now he just covers the team that Syracuse is playing. His name is Matt Merchel with the Orlando Sentinel and Tribune, and we're happy to talk to him uh, as a self-described long-suffering Cubs fan. But, hey, we got to talk football. So, players to watch for FSU from the Syracuse perspective. What do you got for us? Well, I think the, the ones that stand out to me are, are one on the defensive side of things. I think, you know, you, you look at, uh, you know, Jermaine Johnson, you know, defensive line, defensive edge rusher. He's been a, a graduate transfer from Georgia. He's had a monster year so far this year. Five and a half sacks. He's really been disruptive. A, a great addition for this defense, which really I felt like last year that was one of their you know kind of weaknesses was they didn't have that kind of pass rush. He's been able to pro- provide that along with Kier, Kier Thomas, who was an, another graduate transfer from South Carolina. Those two have kind of been bookends on that line and they've been able to cause some pressure and, and get to the quarterback. And on the flip side, on the offensive side of the ball, Jay Sean Corbin has yeah. been, you know, their big explosive playmaker. He's a guy that's had a couple big runs, had a 75-yard touchdown run against Louisville, won an 89-yarder against Notre Dame in the, in the in the opener. So he's been kind of their their spark, so to speak, you know, on the offensive side of things. Uh, not that they've had a lot of spark on the offensive side, but he's been the guy that's really kind of had the big play capabilities that's really kind of impressed them so far early in the season. Let's. Uh, what about on the other side of things? What do you have to say about Syracuse? From the FSU perspective, some players to watch for on the orange. Well, you know, I think, you know, obviously, you know, when you look at what, you know, that that Syracuse brings, they're coming off a really hot, hot start, you know, not hot start so much so, but, you know, look at what they've done over the last couple of weeks. Uh, you know, really, you know, nice, solid play. I think for me, when I, I look at Syracuse, the one person you've got to look at it is Sean Tucker. You know, I mean, I think a guy that, uh, you know, freshman running back, you know, he leads the second in the nation in rushing, you know, all, and second in all-purpose yards. He's a guy that really, I think, you know, if you're Florida State defensive front line, you've got to make sure you can contain. Um, he's a guy I think that can really cause, 
you know, cause all sorts of, of havoc. And I think that's something you got to watch out for. I think also you got to look out for lineman Cody Roscoe. I mean, you know, he has five and a half sacks as well. He's been, you know, really, you know, really kind of a, a top, you know, top defensive player for them. He's the guy that can cause trouble. And you, when you think about Florida State struggles on the offense, you know, I, I think it's all about giving up negative plays. And they, they've got to avoid that because that's something that's really put them in deep holes and something they can't afford to have happen again in this game if they want to have a chance to get their first one of the season. Talking to Matt and Michelle behind enemy lines here on Exit 31 and ESPN Radio. If you look at the numbers, SU is given up by 85.3 yards per game, FSU 132.5. But you factor in competition – it's coming down to the run game overall from everything that we can analyze, all the scouting reports we need. But then when you factor in, uh, and you can take this and run with this, third down conversions seem to be an issue for both teams. And to Syracuse's benefit, FSU, it's one of the worst teams in the conference in the ACC in limiting the explosive big plays. And then on the flip side of that, um, you've got a guy named Sean Tucker who's He's ripped off quite a few of those this year. That has to be a concern. Yeah, very much so. I mean, I mean, when you look at, you know, I wrote about this for today's paper. You know, when you look at, you know, the big plays have really hurt this this FSU team. I mean, they you know, they've given up, you know, so many explosive plays. It doesn't help you when you go up against a guy like Malik Cunningham. You know, Louisville's quarterback last week. He had a couple big plays. Had a seventy yard touchdown run that actually got called back on a penalty. Um, they just can't find a way to stop teams from having those, those big plays. Um, and that's been a big concern, you know, because, uh, you know, when you, you feel like you're in the game or you feel like maybe you've got an opportunity to, to make a comeback or you're, you may have been able to flip the field, then, you know, your opponent comes out and, and puts together a 40 or 50 yard run or touchdown. Um, it, it's tough for them. And I think the other thing you mentioned is the third downs, you know, they've, they've just been so many third and longs. I mean, uh, I was going back and looking, they've had 16 plays so far this season of more than, than third and 10 yards. Um, and you're, you're not going to win very many games if you, if you continue to do that. A lot of that, some of that comes from penalties. Some of that comes from mis- miscommunication, um, sacks, you know, things like that. Tackles for loss, you know, from teams, they put themselves in these early holes and then they can't find a way to, to come back from that. So, um, it, it's definitely been a concern. We know Florida State ranks uh, last in the conference in third down conversion, and Syracuse is not that far ahead of them at 37%. So both these two teams, I think, have to focus on how they can get that third down conversion and continue to extend the plays because I think that's really both teams may have struggled at times. Matt Merchell of the Orlando Sentinel and Tribune joining us on Exit 31, ESPN Radio, and QSportsTalk.com. Matt, uh, Garrett Schrader is getting the start under center for Syracuse. Mm-hmm. He is over 10 on uh, passes from of more than 20 yards. He has not shown really the ability to get the passing game going. So for, for Florida State, are they worried at all? Are they concerned about the passing game, or are they really solely really focused on the run? You know, I, I think they are concerned of the passing game. I think you have to be. I mean, you know, as much as you've done, a, a, you know, as much as you've got a quarterback who maybe isn't, you know, good when it comes with the deep ball, I think you can't fall asleep to that because you know this is a secondary that has been burned by that. And then we talked about those big plays early on. You know, they they you know listen the game they lost to. Uh, Jacksonville State, you know, it was on a last play. It was a game-winning, uh, you know, like a 53-yard, you know, touchdown play where they basically missed tackles, and that was a play where they should have been in a prevent-style defense. And instead, they wanted to rush the box because they felt like they wanted to prevent maybe a quick play that would have set up, you know, a- another play. So that's where you can't get, fall into love with this idea of just being focused on, you know, limiting uh, Sean Taylor's of those, you know, what he can do, limiting those kind of gaps. Uh, you know, they still have to do that, but I, I think they have to watch out because you just, you're just you just not sure, especially with a guy like, like Schrader, you know, who does have a little bit of mobility, you know, so you're going to want to make sure he doesn't get out in front of you a little bit, and you got to make sure then in those opportunities that he doesn't take advantage of that and, and lure you in and then hit you over the top of the deep pass. Behind Enemy Lines with Matt Merchell on ESPN Radio, of course, FSU and Syracuse tomorrow. So a little earlier, we went through Syracuse's injury report. Up here, Dino Babers calls it the Owies. I uh, want to look at that as far as FSU is concerned. Uh, of course, uh, some players d- didn't play against Louisville in the loss. It's so weird to talk about a winless Florida State team after four games, by the way. But Maurice Smith, is he going to be back? What can you tell us about uh, Fabian Lovett? If I mispronounce the name, correct me. Uh, Lawrence to Philly. And is Jordan Travis going to be back to back up Mackenzie Milton? You know, I, I know earlier this week that Mike Norvell said that all those guys, were, he's hoping to have them back. I think Travis might be kind of more of a, I think he's listed as a backup, but I think it's more going to be kind of a, of a game time decision. Um, you know, he didn't play at all 
uh, last week against Louisville. Um, I think they were trying to limit him. Chubba Purdy was the, the, the backup in that role. I think Chubba's still going to kind of have a, a major role in there. Um, Maurice, uh, you know, we talked about Maurice. He was uh, banged up a little bit. They would like to get him back as much as they can. This offensive line has been decimated by injuries and things like that. And, and they've had to move guys around, you know, um, and, and put them in spots. They're not comfortable. Robert Scott last week played right tackle. Um, you know, he was a, he's a tackle, but he's most used to playing the left side. He played right because of those injuries. And he was, I think he gave up four sacks last week to, to, to Louisville. So you want to make sure you get some of these guys back. I'm not sure if Levitt's going to be back from what, from what Norvell said. You know, they were hoping to have him back. But, again, they've been kind of, I don't want to say cagey, but, you know, I mean, again, they, they don't necessarily uh, have been a, as open about some of their injuries. I think a lot of that, lot of that is because they just want to make sure they get the guys back and, and ready to go. Syracuse's defense has been one of you know the the best in the country. You know we we expect the Syracuse's defense to be a little bit better than the offense, but maybe not quite as good as they've been. Eighteen quarterback sacks. So, how has the offensive line for Florida State been so far this year? Do you think Syracuse is going to be able to overcome that and really put a lot of pressure on Milton uh, under center? Yeah, you know, I mean, again, like I mentioned, with the with the idea of. Uh, you know, when you look at how, you know, Florida State's had injuries and things like that, I think that's got to be a little bit of a concern for Florida State. You know, last week we saw Mackenzie Milton, you know, in, in situations where he had to kind of scramble out or he, he really kind of felt the pressure. You know, he, he was sacked uh, six times last week. So that's a concern. Now, Milton obviously has been not as, as usual self because he's coming back from that devastating knee injury. He occurred in 2019. He's not nearly as mobile as he was. I think that's why they like to use Jordan Travis a little bit more early on because they felt his mobility was a little bit better. Um, you know, and, and in terms of this line, the line has been relatively at most spots. You know, Dylan Gibbons has come in as a transfer from Notre Dame. He's filled a nice like, left guard spot. You know, Devontae Love-Smith has played – three different spots so far this season, right uh, right guard and right tackle. I'm sorry, two different spots, right guard and right tackle. Darius Washington has played three different spots, has, has played left tackle, right tackle, and center. So they've had a lot of guys who had to really kind of move around the line because they haven't had some, some availability. They hope to get, like I mentioned, Maurice back. Uh, they hope to get some of these other guys, Brady Scott, uh, a little bit more healthy as well. Um, they need to do that because really, honestly, outside of maybe a core six or seven guys, um, they don't have as much experience on that line, so they need to make sure they keep everyone upright. Matt Merchell with the Orlando Sentinel and Tribune is behind enemy lines with us on Exit 31 on ESPN Radio and QSportsTalk.com. Got a couple minutes left with you, Matt, and I think I would be remiss if I neglected to say rest in peace to Bobby Bowden, but give you 30 seconds mm-hmm. to a minute to just tell us a little bit about his legacy and what he still means to that program. Oh, he was huge. I mean, you know, and, and just not just to the football, the X's and O's parts of it. You know, I think it was the human side of things. You know, you talk to any player, ex-player, any coach, assistant coach who played, you know, coached under him. Um, they'll all tell you about his personality and how about he, how, what a, what a wonderful human being he was. You know, he, he reached out and was able to, you know, really kind of help, you know, those, those players and those coaches move, uh, you know, move on and, and have great careers. Um, he meant so much to Florida State. He really put Florida State on the map football wise. They were about ready to to shut the program down, you know, before he came in, in, in the seventies. Um, and you know, he turned this program into into a national powerhouse. And not only did he, he win with you know and have success, but he was also willing to share that a little bit. You know, he's willing to schedule the schools on the on you know schedule games against schools in the state here that helped kind of provide them a little bit. UCF, for instance. You know, he scheduled a couple of games with UCF when UCF was first starting out as a program, and that it was a huge boost for them. He actually went to, to Orlando here and played UCF and, and was able to kind of help provide them with a little bit of a boost for their ticket sales and things like that. So, obviously, a, a, a great human being. Obviously, what he did on the football field as well. So, and it's and it was a tremendous you know loss for the community as well. Matt, normally we ask beat writers about their favorite dome memories for home games, but since this is an away game. We wanted to ask you for a score prediction between Syracuse and FSU. Well, you know, I think it's going to be a close game. And, and, I, and when I looked at what this team does, um, and, and Florida State has played close games most of the season, you know, that just seems to be the way that things have gone. This is, this is a team that has a lot of fire. You know, they have, they have tried to come back and, and, and both, you know, against Notre Dame. Uh, they, they came back against Louisville a little bit, just fell a little short. I think it's going to be a close game. I, I think Florida State has got to crack the, at some point, get past and get a win. I think this is the best opportunity right now. It could be something around the range of, of you know, uh, 28 to 24. Uh, they can score some points. Both teams can score some points, but both teams have solid defenses. Um, again, it comes down to, I think, big explosive plays and third down conversions. We appreciate you more than you know, Matt Michelle, for taking some time and tell us a little bit about this game tomorrow with SU and FSU. 
hey, listen, plan on it next year. We're going to reach out again uh, pending them being on the schedule. All right? Is it a deal? That, that sounds good. That sounds a deal. Anytime you need me, just, just hit me up. It's a deal. That's Matt Michelle, uh, grateful for the time. We're going to flip to the NFL, though, but keep the subject football. Our weekly check-in with John Schmelk from Giants.com, since ESPN Radio is the home of a New York Giants football I'm expecting them to be like Florida State and 0-4 when it's all said and done. And we'll do that next on Exit 31 on ESPN Radio. This is Exit 31 with Rain and Spencer on ESPN Radio and QSportsTalk.com. John Schmelk with Giants.com in his usual slot with us on a football Friday about 3.15 here on ESPN Radio. Yeah, Howard was on with uh, Orange Nation yesterday. And you just put out your, your well, your daily report, really. Let's play John Schmelk back to John Schmelk and then let him add on anything else that we need to know. Here we go, quick. It was a day like I've not oh, that's, Hang on, before. hang on. That was Operator Air. I, I played the wrong piece of audio. My bad. We- With your Giants Radio Network update, I'm John Schmelk. The Giants take on the Saints on Sunday in the Superdome, and they're going to be without four starters from last week. Middle linebacker Blake Martinez out for the year with a torn ACL. Left guard Ben Bredesen out with a hand injury, while wide receivers Darius Slayton and Sterling Shepard are both out with hamstring injuries. It means a bigger opportunity for wide receiver Kadarius Toney. Though according to head coach Joe Judge, it's not the injuries that's giving him a chance, but rather a natural progression as to how far he's come since the summer. I would expect him to be doing more than we've seen in previous weeks, just naturally, not based on anyone being injured, just naturally based on his progression within the system. As for Kadarius Toney, he says he's ready for a bigger role. Mid- pretty good as far as accepting the role that I'm being placed in as far as receiving more reps and stuff like that. It's just all about executing when I go out there, you know what I'm saying, to play. The Saints defense has forced a league-high seven turnovers this year, including six interceptions, is top three against the run, and will benefit from what's sure to be a raucous Superdome crowd when the Saints host the Giants Sunday at 1 with coverage beginning at noon. They're going to be happy to get back into that building. Do the Giants have enough to avoid going 0-4 John Schmelk? By the way, you started playing Howard Cross, and I'm like, wow, my voice sounds awesome. That's unbelievable. I I was just really disappointed (laughs) afterwards. (laughs) But uh, look, I think think there are two big-time challenges this week, all right? One is the atmosphere and the crowd, because that place is going to be loud. It's the first time since 2019 the Saints will be playing in front of a full crowd in the Superdome. So that place is going to be nutso. And then combine that with the fact that Saints probably have a top three, four defense in the league, which will help that defense get off the ball, make it a little slow for the Giants to get off the ball as offensive linemen uh, to protect the quarterback. They forced seven takeaways this year, six interceptions. So to me, those are the two biggest challenges. If this game was on a neutral field, I think the Giants have a real good chance here. And frankly, I think they have a chance to go down there and win anyway if they can kind of filter out that noise and, and protect the football. Because the Saints offense, guys, 31st in the league. They're averaging under 300 yards per game. It has not been impressive. They don't know Michael Thomas, so they kind of are doing a wide receiver by committee type of deal. So their offense is not that scary. Their defense, on the other hand, is is terrifying. Jameis is Jameis is the way I look at it. Right, Spencer? (laughs) I I mean, you don't know which version of Jameis Winston you're going to get. That's really my thing. Go ahead. You don't know. You also don't know what his his trainer said because he can't remember that either. But – uh, what do the Giants really need to do this week in order to be able to to have a chance at winning this? Does it do they need to focus more on letting Daniel Jones throw the ball? Do they need to get Saquon Barkley more involved? What's the focus like going to be like on the offensive end for this week? Do you think? Yeah, you know it's going to be tough because there's really nothing that the Saints do that poorly. To be quite honest with you, uh, they play a much different style of defense than the teams the Giants played the first three weeks that were very zone heavy and played a lot of two safeties deep. The Saints will play man-to-man. They'll play single high. They'll even sprinkle it a little bit of cover zero. They'll blitz a lot, five, six, seven-man pressures. So they're going to put pressure on this Giants offense. Now, usually against an offense like that, the answer is, all right, you go over the top and you try to make big plays, right, to make them pay for being that aggressive. Well, here's the problem. The Saints are in the top five in the league in terms of preventing big plays. Quarterbacks on passes 20 or more yards in the air have a quarterback rating against them of 25 this year. Best in the league. So it's tough to find a really good answer because the Saints defense is just filled with high draft picks, and frankly, they're just very, very good. So I think the key here for the Giants offense is to protect the football, uh, try to make some big plays here or there without forcing it because the Saints will take advantage of that and, and, and turn you over, give their offense some short fields. 
But don't make mistakes. The Saints have won games with their defense this year by getting short fields for their offense that has not performed well. So I think you, you protect the ball, you try to make big plays, and then you try to turn over Jameis Winston, who's only thrown it 21 times a game to the heaviest run team in the league in terms of run rate. And he's, despite the fact he's only thrown it 21 times a game, we've seen some throws this year where he's getting tackled, he's getting sacked, and he just kind of throws the ball up in the middle of the field. So you can force him into mistakes. So that, to me is what the formula is. And most importantly, maybe, guys, is get up to a fast start. Try to take this crowd out of the game early. If you go down big in this game early on, it's going to be really hard to come back because that crowd is going to make it very difficult on you. So I think getting up to a fast start is really, really important in this game. Boy, even down a couple of receivers, that's the thing. The Giants need a game like that. Maybe this is a team they could take advantage of and do that. Saquon Barkley, though, we're, we're all clamoring for him to get into a good place and not be still in the rehab process or just getting back to 100%. And we know it's going to be slow going, but he did say, basically I'm paraphrasing, trust the process. That's what he's doing. Uh, How much longer do we trust the process before we feel like he's just fully unleashed? I know what we hear, but realistically from your perspective, Hey, look, he had over – and by the way, you're right. This is the wrong week to have two wide receivers out against a team that's going to play a lot of man. So that's Mm -hmm. not what you want. Um, 100% right on that. Number two, look, Saquon looks healthy to me. You know, is it like a 1,000% like just as explosive as he looked the day he walked in the building? Maybe he's not there. And you might not get there this year, to be honest with you. But he's certainly healthy enough, elusive enough, explosive enough where he's still like a you know top five percentile in the league in those categories, where he should be able to run the ball well. Now, the Saints have a great run defense. They're allowing only 60 yards per game, second best in the league, under three yards per carry. So they're going to be a tough team to run against. But I think it's more him getting the feel for running the ball again. And I think we saw that come back last week a little bit more, where the instincts are getting better, the feel's getting better. Now, unfortunately, you're going to have your fourth or different starting left guard in, in as many weeks this week, I think, I'm guessing it's going to be Wes Martin, who they signed off the practice squad from Washington this week. That's probably going to get, get the start there. But who knows? Maybe it's going to be uh, Matt Scorer, who they brought in a few weeks ago. We don't know the answer to that question yet. But, you know, that to me it has been a factor, too. But, uh, look, even if it's not a run, guys, talk about the Saints playing man-to-man. You know what matchup I like? Saquon Barkley against anybody in a man-to-man situation in the passing game. Isolate him on an angle right, an option route. Get up to him in stride in space and let him make a big play with the ball in his hands. John Schmoke, reporter of Giants.com, joining us on Exit 31 ESPN Radio, QSportsTalk.com. John, last week we uh, we had a little bit of a mini kerfuffle between you and Rain over uh, Jason Garrett and his offensive uh, play calling. John set me straight, man. That's he all good. Set, he set you straight. So my question to you is, though, do you think that Jason Garrett is putting Daniel Jones in in a position to succeed? Is he making Daniel Jones better with his play calling? Because it just doesn't seem like, at least from my perspective, my outside perspective, that Daniel Jones has really improved greatly over the last couple of years. Yeah, look, I think you have much more fair complaints after only scoring 14 points against the Falcons, which I think you want more points than that. Um, But look, look, when you watch the tape, guys are open. And plays are made. The offense has been efficient. Daniel Jones has one interception in his last nine games. Those are all good things. But I do think you need to figure out a way to get more out of successful plays. And I think there are two ways you do that. One, you be a little bit more aggressive, go throwing the ball down the field. I think part of that is, is the play calling. Some of that is Daniel Jones, you know, making decisions on where he's throwing the ball. Um, I think it, there are two parts of that. But I think you do need more downfield shots. Now, protecting long enough to do that against the Saints this week could be interesting, but I think you have to take them. And the second part is you have to get more yards after the catch. The Giants are next to last in the league this year in terms of the percentage of their passing yards that come after the catch. So I think you have to create more routes where you can get the ball to the receiver in stride um, on the move so they can make plays after they catch the ball. But I was watching the tape this week, and there are some plays where those situations are there but the ball isn't put in the right place so the receiver can catch it and then make the most out of the play. Um, could you argue there could be some more motion before the snap at times, that there could be some more bunk, uh, bunch formations, some more rubber outs? Look, you can make that argument, but there are plays out there to be made, and the ones that are out there, the players aren't executing well enough 
to make them. So I think when you're in a situation like this, I think they're, depending on the play, there are different things you can look at. John, I got one last question for you. I want to flip to the defense. I want to bring up Pat, Patrick Graham. Big fan, obviously. I think he did a great job last year. But you brought up the score in 14 points and then losing on that close game against Atlanta. I thought you should have won that game, but the defense gives up these decisive points late in the game. Uh, dissect that situation for us. You kind of can't have that, right? You got to be able to close a team out and win a game. Yeah, and, and I think you probably heard me sigh there because this has been a problem dating back to last year yeah. where in two-minute drill situations, whether at the end of the halves or in the games, the Giants defense has had trouble getting off the field when the other team's going to pass, you know they're going to pass, they know that you know that they know they're going to pass, and you have trouble getting those stops. And I think part of that is getting a more consistent pass rush. I think that's a big part of that. And forcing those big negative plays. You know, that's why the Giants have had such struggles getting in the end zone, right? You get in the red zone and they have a sack or a penalty and it's second and 17 and you can't score. Well, the Giants aren't creating those negative plays in those two-minute situations. They need to start doing a better job of that and putting a little bit more pressure on the offense in those situations. So you're right. I think the defense overall has been fine, but in those two-minute situations, it has not been. So they need to get a little bit better in those spots. And I think the offense does too, by the way, in executing in those spots too. And if they did do better in those spots, they might be 2-1 and one right now instead of 0-3. Yeah, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Spot on as usual. John Schmelk with Giants.com with us here. Exit 31 ESPN Radio and QSportsTalk.com. We're going to come back after a quick break and we'll give you sound check. We're going to hear a little bit more from Dino Babers. This is Exit 31 with Rain and WKTV Sports Director Spencer Davidson on ESPN Radio and QSportsTalk.com. Listen to this. Mic check. Okay, good. Here's your sports sound check. You may have heard it live yesterday with Brent Axe on the block. Tommy DeVito, of course, with his remarks. And when he found out he wasn't starting against Liberty, and we shared that with you a little bit earlier today, Tommy told him a couple hours before kickoff on a Friday Night Lights game uh, with probably one of the best quarterbacks they're going to see this year. It's not the same at the quarterback position tomorrow against FSU, but do you beat a winless team? There's the litmus test. Well, we'll find out about that and much more as we hear from Dino Babers from the Dino Babers show last night. Hence, sound check. Are you ready? Ready. Let's uh, read and react. I guess it's our version of an audio RPO, something uh, along those lines. I which, like that. Which option do we take? I don't know if that was good or not. You know what? I'm going to give it to you. Thanks, buddy. I'm going to give it to you. Thanks. We're going to start with video games, though. There's some gamers out there. That's for sure. And Dino told a funny story about players learning coverages from Madden, but I'll let him explain more. You know, we do have some Madden players on our team, but I've got a a story to share with you. I've got, uh, I've never played one of those games. No? You know, not any video game of any kind? Not like, not like, you know, with the offense, you pick the offense, you pick the defense, you let them do the play. I've never done one. And the first time I ever really saw one was I was at Baylor with, uh, uh, Josh Gordon and Terrence Williams and Lanier Sampson and, and all these fantastic players. And they were at my house having a barbecue and they're like, and I like to cook the food fresh. So they're like, Coach, what are we going to do while you're cooking? I said, I don't know. You guys can do whatever you want. Can we bring our video game over real quick? So they bring the video game over. I'm cooking. I'm halfway done. I walk in and then for the very first time I see this Madden stuff. And I'm looking at it. I'm like, this is amazing. You get to pick your defenses. It's cover two. It's cover three. You get to pick your play. And then all of a sudden, I got mad. And I mean, I got mad. And the players were like, coach, why are you so mad? I'm like, you guys play this game all the time. I'm trying to teach you coverages. And you guys keep screwing it up. And you guys act like you don't know what coverages are. And you're playing this thing two or three hours a night. And the coverage is right in front of you. I got really mad. Oh, man, what a missed opportunity. How do you not dissect and learn the coverages? My word. It was right there in front of you. You think that's a conversation that he's brought into the Syracuse locker room? Hey, if you guys are playing Madden, why don't you pay attention to the coverages so you can learn a little bit of something, learn the X's and O's, do your homework. Um, Ohana. Probably. You think that happens? I, I Absolutely, I think that happened. I think I, I I think that he he's he learns from his mistakes. So I, I think that he really drills at home now because all these guys are playing video games. I mean, you know, uh, Tommy DeVito, when we spoke with him uh, right before the season started, 
he was saying he's a big video game guy. Now, I think he said he doesn't play Madden that much. He's more of a Call of Duty guy. Yeah, what was the rating? Glue guy popped the mic on. What was the, the rating that he had that I had no idea what you were talking about? And oh, the, the, the KD the ratio. KD. And it, his was good, right? Yes, very. it was very good. It's not a Kevin Durant rate. No, ra- it's rating. not. It, explain to everybody what that is. It's a kill to death ratio. Yeah, there you go. I don't mm. play that video game. It's a great game. I, I, told I recommend. You, Spencer, I told you off the air the other day that for me, I still have issues with Duck Hunt. And breaking oh, the guns yeah. from back when I was in like high school. Yep. Still frustrated. I broke three of them. I yeah, told you that the was story. A fru- that was a frustrating game. And also, if the, if the, the gun wasn't calibrated right, then there's no way you'd hit a duck. And that ruins it even more. I mean, I didn't use it to learn how to be a hunter. And I certainly didn't learn anything about football coverages from playing that game. But I still can't stand that snickering dog. That's another story. <laughs> We're continuing in sound check here on X31 on ESPN Radio and QSportsTalk.com. Hearing a little bit from Dino Babers in the Dino Babers show yesterday. Listen, it's FSU tomorrow, and we asked Matt Merchell about the legacy of Bobby Bowden. Oh, I think we all know, but here's what Dino said. Uh, I got an opportunity to meet uh, Bobby Bowden when I was at UCLA. I was working for Carl Durrell, who's now the head coach at Colorado. We were in a bowl game uh, with Florida State in San Francisco Giants Stadium. And I wanted, I can't, the Emerald Bowl. It was the Emerald Bowl. And we got to spend an entire week with Florida State and Bobby Bowden and his wife, and it was unbelievable. Everything you read about him is absolutely true. Uh, God, godly man, fantastic leader. Uh, the coolest thing was in the bowl game, we, we weren't on opposite sidelines. We were on the same sidelines. So when the ball got close to the 50, you could hear, why, scat, 88, <laughs> we're calling something. And then they're calling blue, Tampa 2 defense. <laughs> you can actually hear the two calls going in right next to each other. But you got an opportunity to see Bobby Bowden not only work, but to spend time with him the entire week. Uh, my first year at uh, Bowling Green, we went to a bowl game. I want to say that he was the guest speaker that came in and spoke to both teams at the banquet for the for the bowl game. But uh, fantastic man. Uh, both his sons, Terry and, and, and Tommy, and Tommy are both unbelievable. And, uh, you know, just one of those guys with his legacy and his family, somebody that did really good. Larger than life, one of one of those figures in the sport that's larger than life, and you always heard from afar how fantastic it was, and now, of course, Dino telling you more. I mean, just so well-respected around the game, and somebody that it doesn't matter, he doesn't have to be a part of your team or your program to, to, to root for, to, to like him, because we have to remember something, folks. As much as we love sports and we're passionate about passionate about sports, there is life outside of sports. And if you're a good human being, it doesn't matter what jersey you wear. It doesn't matter what sweater vest colors you have. You, If you're a good person, that's really what, what makes a difference. So, you know, rest in peace to, to Bobby Bowden. I mean, it's, a, it's certainly a huge loss for the, for the game of football, um, but, but also just for, for humanity. We said a huge kumbaya moment right here on X31 on ESPN Radio. Thanks to Spencer Davidson. I'm Rain. Blue guys in here. Sound check, of course, featuring Dino Babers from the Dino Babers show last night. Talked about getting a hot start against FSU. Hey, that's a little something that, that Stephen Bailey told us about, too. But here's Dino's words. Yeah, the, the, th- the biggest thing about a two-minute drive early is that you, re- you really don't uh, get to establish one of your better players, which is, coach, which is Sean Tucker. Sean Tucker... We want to we want to come out early and find out what they're going to do to stop Sean Tucker because we may have an adjustment to what they're going to do to stop Sean Tucker. We may have a ground adjustment, we may have a uh, a passing adjustment, okay? And if they're really doing things to stop him, they're really giving us advantages somewhere else and you want to be able to see those advantages and make sure that you can direct the attack at, at the right area and that would give us an opportunity to start fast. We, we, you know, we're, we're going to take our shots because we need to take our shots because we think there's going to be shots there just like there were shots last week. The key thing is connecting on those shots uh, because, you know, Sean creates an advantage. If you're going to turn around and hand him the ball, they, may, they need to do things to make sure that he doesn't uh, start to have some success. My fingers are crossed that they can somehow establish the passing game a little bit, just enough to use the old cliche, keep them honest. Because if they can do that, then I really expect that Sean Tucker can do some damage against the numbers that are out there and what we expect from FSU's defense. But I believe in Sean Tucker. He's legit. I don't want to factor in 
the lower level of competition. I, I think he's a legit running back, and I think his future is, as they say, another sports cliche, cliche excuse me, playing on Sundays. We've got the guy that can counter that narrative. I, I, I agree with that. I think that Sean Tucker has proven so far that he is a an extremely valuable, extremely talented rusher. And I and and he I mean he's also been their leading receiver. So he's a multifaceted player with a lot of different tools. And I, I, I think what you saw against Albany is yeah, you you know, it was it was lesser competition, but he was dominant. And these are still collegiate football players, and he just looked like a man among boys out there. And then last week against Liberty, I mean he he was he was solid as well. He, so he can yeah. still be a factor out of the backfield catching the ball, but you need wide receivers to catch Agreed. some passes as well. It, the, the passing game has to graduate to that level. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, you. no, no, you're fine. I was actually gonna gonna shift to a, a point uh, that you know, especially getting Tucker going early on. I just think in general, it's gonna be very important for Syracuse to have a fast start in this one. FSU is coming in 0 and 4. They think, all right, we're in our building. This is Syracuse, a team we've had our way with here at home. We're going to come out, and, and this is going to be our first win. We're going to run them out of the building. Well, then you got North Carolina next. And, right. and then if they want a, a little bit lesser competition, it's UMass after that before they get their first win. Could you imagine if they don't get their first win till October 23rd? That's the that, Florida that would State be wild. Seminoles. That would be wild. But, but they're in a fragile state right now, yeah. FSU. Being 0-4, coming in like that, they're in a fragile state. If you're Syracuse, you want to come out with a fast start and put them down before they can get a chance to get going because I'm sure their confidence level will be severely shaken if they give up some quick points to Syracuse and they're like, all right, here we go again. Oh boy, we're already 0-4. Thought this was a winnable game. Yep. Maybe not. Let's close out with a quick comment on Dino and quarterbacks because, I mean, honestly, it's we, ha- we have to. I feel like we have to. You can't keep practicing like that. It's not fair to whoever goes out there first. And as this thing develops and or things change, the only way, the only person you can be fair to is the one that's out there. That's out there. So, you know, the reps have changed in practice, and but whoever gets that opportunity, whoever's hot, is going to get the opportunity to stay hot and not necessarily make it fair where they can cool down. Move the offense, rest the defense, put up some points, win a football game. I honestly don't care who it is at quarterback as long as that happens. For now, we're going to see what Garrett Schrader can do with a second start in a row. The FSU game tomorrow. Exit 31 ESPN Radio. That was Soundcheck. We're at QSportsTalk.com. Why don't we come back with the last thing we'll say today? This is Exit 31. Here is Rain Stradamus and Nostra Davidson on ESPN Radio and QSportsTalk.com. Here's the last thing we'll say today. You know what's good from October 1 through October 31? You want to know? Uh, candy corn. Duncan Halloween at the Park, presented by AmeriQ wow. Federal Credit Union and Upstate Galisano Children's Hospital. Jamesville Beach Park, 7 to 10 every night. 10 bucks gets you through Sunday through Thursday, 15 Friday and Saturday. Pre sale only. And you can get your tickets uh, at Halloween at the park.com. You get Duncan too. Remember, we talked about this oh, before? That's awesome. You get the six, uh, the six donuts, you get the coupon. It's a free half dozen. As soon as you get up to the gate in your vehicle, it was it was a massive success last year. It's like a mile long, spooky, family friendly, the theme ride, obviously, pumpkin and Halloween related. And you can also get like, for example, it's a five dollar purchase. The pumpkin face fiber optic LED wands. Oh, you can get get wands. They got different uh, eight different theme sections. There's witch and ghost and pumpkin and spider and skeleton and castle and village and mansion and, you know, create those visuals, those spooky Halloween visuals in your own mind. And you can dress up too. take I was pictures ask if that. you want to. Oh, yeah, you can get interactive with this. It's a lot of fun. It was it was killer last year. Can I dress up as Rain Man? Um, just I'll just put like a, you know, a bald cap on. No, 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 no. I'll give permission. Get a razor. Shave the head. Shave ah, the dome. I don't know if I could do that. Come on, yes, you can. Grow I would, back its hair. I, I would look terrible. Yours will grow back. I will look terrible with that. Yours will grow back. You, will it though? Mine. I'm afraid that if you know, like my hair is basically waiting for me to just shave off and be like, ha ha. What was we're it? Never coming back. There was a Seinfeld episode where Elaine's boyfriend shaved his head. He was like a New Jersey Devils yes. fan. Yeah, the buddy, and, buddy, right? Yes. Yeah, and it never came back. Yeah. Well, so you serves run, him right. He's a Devils fan. You run the risk, buddy. Oh, wait. I can't say that anymore because the, the comments are now the Devils affiliates. Hey, so. you just bonded a little bit with the Crunch fans. Uticus, <laughs> man. We are getting close to hockey season. But the news came out 
Kendrick Lamar, Eminem, Mary J. Bly, Snoop Dogg, and Dre 2022 Super Bowl halftime show, February 13th, SoFi Stadium, Inglewood, California. Basically, LA's got the big game back, and that's an awesome lineup. That's a fantastic lineup. It's, I mean, I, that's legendary. How right do you there. not love that? It's going to be ridiculous. Honestly, for me, like just having Eminem would be awesome. And then you add all those other people. It's just great. Although I was thinking today or earlier, like, what is Eminem going to actually sing or, or rap? Because he's not he's not going to be able to curse. He can just bring and pass out mom spaghetti from his new restaurant in Detroit. Oh my god! Can you imagine if he just we throws think. wads of spaghetti into the crowd? Just just come out holding bowls of spaghetti and pass them out <laughs> to everybody that's up in the front there. It, it's it's a great halftime. You know, there's years I'm like, ooh, and there's other years I'm like, yeah, yeah. all right. I mean, like you know, last year for me, the weekend, like I, I don't really no, listen to him, so no. it didn't do anything for me. Massive step down in my humble opinion. I didn't really love Katy Perry, even yeah. even though like the dancing sharks or whatever that was. That was fantastic. If you remember, was it like left shark and right shark mm-hmm. or something along those lines? The Prince year was Prince good. was amazing. You've, you've had some great ones in over Minnesota. the years. And, and Bruce Springsteen. Springsteen, was the boss. Uh, but you've had some stinkers. We got to get ready and make way for Brent Axe, his version of Football Friday. He's going to be on the block at 4 o'clock. We'll be back in two hours and three minutes after a brief Axe delay. Yankees on deck will return to ESPN Radio. They start a final three-game series against Tampa tonight.